the Department of Modern Languages, Linguistics, and Intercultural Communication, and the Global Studies programs here at UMBC. Before we begin, I would like to make some acknowledgments. First, I want to acknowledge that UMBC was established upon the land of, this, of the Piscataway and Susquehannock peoples. Over time, citizens of many more indigenous nations have come to reside in this region. We humbly offer our respect to all past, present, and future indigenous people connected to this place. I want to thank the Department of American Studies, the Department of Modern Languages, Linguistics, and Intercultural Communication, and the Latino and Hispanic Faculty Association for, for co-sponsoring tonight's lecture. A quick reminder about features that are available during the event. Um, our speaker, Carmen Chavez, will respond to questions immediately after their lecture. Questions can be submitted at any time into the Q&A chat box. To enable the Q&A box, please click on the three dots at the bottom right corner of the screen and select Q&A. We have live captioning during this event. You can enable captioning by clicking on the three dots and selecting multimedia viewer. A special thanks to Francis Freeman and Vital Science, Vital Science for providing their live captioning services. The talk tonight will be recorded and made available on the Dresher Center's YouTube page. You can also connect with the Dresher Center on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I invite you to attend the next Humanities Forum event coming up in a few weeks. You have it here on the screen. This is going to take place on Thursday, April 8th at 4 p.m. And it's titled Critical Access Studies, Methods, and Approaches from the Humanities, a talk by Amy Hamry, Hamry um, Associate Professor of Medicine, Health, and Society and American Studies, and Director of the Critical Design Lab Vanderb at Vanderbilt uh, University. Amy Hamry will discuss the emerging field of critical access studies, which questions the values underlying our common approaches to accessibility, as well as the means of achieving it in order to better pursue the project of disability justice. It should be a lively and moving event. And for today's event, I am honored to present our speaker, Karma Chavez. Karma Chavez is Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Mexican American and Latina Latino Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Karma is known for her interdisciplinary scholarship on women of color, feminisms, queer theories, coalitional building, and immigration politics. She is co editor of Text and Field Innovations in Rhetorical Method, standing in in the intersection, feminist voices, feminist practices in communication studies, queer and trans migrations, dynamics of illegalization, detention and deportation, and keywords for gender and sexuality studies. Karma is also author of Queer Migration Politics, Activist Rhetoric and Coalitional Possibilities, Palestine on the Air, and her newest book, The Borders of AIDS, Race, Quarantine and Resistance, will be released from the University of Washington Press in spring 2021. And on top of all this, Karma was uh, participating in mutual aid work last week in Texas alongside other faculty at the University of Texas at Austin. Thank you so much for being here, Karma. Thank you, Tanya. I'm so uh, grateful uh, for your introduction and I'm grateful to all of you uh, I'm really excited to be here and let me, I'm just going to share my screen here uh, real quick. Let's see if I can make this work. Uh, I won't share the whole time, but I'll just share uh, a little bit. Uh, what you see there is, um, whoops, that goes, it's very touchy apparently. Um, you see there's a, a URL there for an accessibility copy if you'd like to uh, read along more or less what this talk is going to be, you can go to that website and there's an accessibility copy there for your viewing. Uh, and there uh, uh, you see the cover of the book, which will be out uh, probably in June, maybe late May, uh, The Borders of AIDS. Uh, so I, I'm very grateful. Uh, thank you, Tanya, for the introduction, uh, Courtney, for all the logistics, Jessica, for the invitation and, and everybody who uh, has helped 
to uh, make this talk possible. I'm grateful to be here. And, and I'm really appreciative to all of you who decided to uh, come out uh, today, uh, come out, I guess, to wherever your computers uh, exist in your homes. And I hope that you're all safe and well. Uh, we have been having an interesting time here in the uh, failed state of Texas uh, over the last week, as um, you know, a lot of folks are without water, without power, um, and as Tanya mentioned, uh, a number of us have been participating in, in, in mutual aid support uh, as a result of uh, the complete neglect uh, and, I guess, by design failures of the state and the city in, in supporting folks. Uh, and there's a lot of need out here. And so if, there, if you see support, uh, you have money to donate to mutual aid here, uh, people can use it. It's like going all directly uh, to the people. Um, and under the leadership of one of your former colleagues, Ashante Reese, uh, who's now my colleague, um, I do not apologize for us uh, taking her from you. Um, she uh, and a group of us, uh, over the course of about three days, we distributed about $33,000 in food and money to people in need. Uh, and that's kind of just the tip of the iceberg of what folks have been doing. So um, that's where I'm coming to you from today. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna bring you my best and I'm also, uh, a bit scattered, so I apologize in advance if that that comes across. Um, but let's let's go ahead and and, and get started. Uh, a person wearing a Ronald Reagan mask, black suit, and long rubber gloves sat casually with his ankles crossed on the top of the cab of a beat up pickup truck, driving through the streets of New York. Guards in army green uniforms flanked the truck, donning the same gloves and what looked like N95 masks. The truck pulled a makeshift concentration camp constructed of bars and razor wire. A watchtower protruded from the center of the camp with yellow images of Reagan's face on all four sides peering out like Big Brother. A multiracial group of prisoners looked out to the street from between the bars and barbed wire as other marchers walked slowly beside them carrying signs proclaiming silence equals death. This prescient performative protest at the 1987 Pride March was the brainchild of the nascent AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power Act Up uh, in New York, which wanted to make a powerful statement about AIDS at the annual event. Whether Act Up members were aware is unclear, but just weeks before the Pride March, the US Senate passed a ban on HIV positive migrants, preventing them from coming to or legalizing within the United States. Some four years later, the reality the float foreshadowed would come into existence as the United States constructed a quarantine camp for intercepted HIV positive Haitians who fled political violence after the overthrow of their president, Jean Bertrand Aristide. Although ACT UP could not have known that they were actually predicting a future for some HIV positive people, the ominous float made a statement about the severity of the situation for people living with AIDS, not just because opportunistic infections could be deadly, but for the ways that the US government would use the disease as an opportunity to alienize already maligned people like Haitians and homosexuals. In a nation state like the United States, which is founded on the creation and maintenance of a populace, a citizenry that is definitionally expulsive, exterminative and exclusionary, whether by genocide, lynching, the plantation, the reservation, the ghetto, the internment camp, the prison, the hospital, quarantine, ban or deportation, Disease becomes one of many opportunities to express this alienizing logic. What I describe as an alienizing logic references a structure of thinking, which insists that some are necessarily members of a community and some are recognized as not belonging, even if they physically reside there. Thus, the alien outside is not part of a simple dichotomy constituted by a firm boundary between two easily identifiable positions. Disease has historically been an opportunity to express the state's alienizing logic when associated with particular people. In the US context, black, migrant, queer, trans, indigenous, poor, prostitute of color. Regardless of whether they possess US citizenship, these are alienized people, as in they are or easily can be made alien to the nation state. My book is about two expressions of alienizing logic, quarantine and ban as they manifested in the early days of the AIDS pandemic in the United States from 1981 to 1993. My book unfolds through five body chapters divided into two sections, with each chapter addressing an important part 
of how HIV AIDS created an opportunity to animate alienizing logic. In the first section, alienizing logic and structure, I emphasize how people with power who frame issues and make decisions utilize disease as an opportunity to enact alienizing logic. This focus helps to see the development and perniciousness of these logics and how they manifest historically and in relation to HIV AIDS. Chapter one maps the development of quarantine laws in the United States in relation to racialized US citizens, migrants, and supposed sexual deviants. Chapter two explains how the historical precedents discussed in the first chapter manifest in the perfect storm that is HIV AIDS in the United States and calls to quarantine play out largely on the backs of black sex workers. Chapter three explores the way that alienizing logic of quarantine morphs into quote unquote national common sense in US immigration law, <coughs> excuse me, as some of the most adamantly in support of nationwide quarantine in the United States become the key architects of the ban on HIV positive immigration in 1987. In the second section, resisting alienizing logic, I shift attention to how mostly queer AIDS activists respond to and resisted alienizing logic as they applied to migrant communities who may or may not have also been queer. On top of everything else, the allergies are back in Austin, so we're just getting it all. <coughs> in this talk, I'm gonna focus on part of the second chapter of the book, which addresses the various media spectacles surrounding the cases of what media, police, and public health officials alike often described as incorrigible Black sex workers. Even as sex workers get disregarded and erased in many histories of HIV and AIDS, U.S. public health officials have long been preoccupied with sex workers as a source of venereal disease, even when there was no proof of any disease at all. Given this history, it should be no surprise that the AIDS pandemic created a uh, conditions to renew such connections and sex workers, especially black ones, became a primary preoccupation for public health and medical officials. Black sex workers also became test cases for either applying existing quarantine laws and policies or for creating new ones and their stories became media sensation. I'm going to discuss a few of their stories in the hopes that we can discuss the complicated ways that public health and medical officials, politicians and law enforcement, as well as media, often work together to intentionally or not use disease as an opportunity to reproduce racism. In Douglas Crimp's essay, Portraits of People with AIDS, he discusses a protest of a 1988 museum exhibit featuring portraits of people living with AIDS. The portraits, Crimp explains, are predictable. People with AIDS are, quote, ravaged, disfigured, and debilitated by the syndrome. They are generally alone, desperate, but resign to their inevitable deaths. The protesters, mostly from ACT UP, engaged visitors in conversation about the problems with the exhibit's representations and handed them a flyer with a statement laying out their view and ending with the following slide. The PWA, the person living with AIDS, is a human being whose health is deteriorated not simply due to the virus, but due to government inaction, the inaccessibility of affordable health care, and institutionalized neglect in the forms of heterosexism, racism, and sexism. We demand the visibility of PWAs who are vibrant, ang angry, loving, sexy, beautiful, acting up, and fighting back. Stop looking at us. Start listening to us. Clearly, both Crimp and the activist's critique is not merely about the exhibit, but of a genre of representations that glorify suffering and supply single dimensional depictions of individuals living with AIDS. Their call for defiant images works only when coupled with the demand not only to look, but to listen to those who are most impacted. The call to listen, particularly to people who refuse the decontextualized victim narrative and who insist upon a structural analysis of the causes of AIDS is crucial not only to affirm the humanity of people living with AIDS, but also to join their fight. Crimp's call is even more important in my view when depicting black people living with AIDS, given their disproportionate rates of infection and death from AIDS and histories of racist representation, generally and in relation to the disease. As Evelyn Hamm Hammonds writes, in this culture, 
How we think about disease determines who lives and who dies. The history of Black people in this country is riddled with episodes displaying how concepts of sickness, disease, health, behavior, and sexuality and race have been intertwined in the definition of normalcy and deviance. The power to define disease and normality makes AIDS a political issue. Questions about the ways AIDS is political and politicized in relation to Blackness are as live now as they were when Hammonds wrote in the 1980s. I'm going to stop sharing. All right. Cool. So in early 1984, Yale New Haven Hospital reported treating four female prostitutes and three of their male clients who manifested signs of AIDS. Although hospital staff warned the women to stop soliciting, two disappeared and one kept working. Upon another arrest, local media identified one of the women as Carlotta Lock Locklear, a 29-year-old Black woman and a drug user with a 15-month-old child who was under the care of the hospital. As Scott Stern notes, the coverage terrified Locklear, who told a local newspaper, I can't even walk to a car because I'm afraid they'll blow my head off. Local AIDS activists also expressed concern about the coverage with one worrying, it gives men a reason to resort to violence against prostitutes. In exchange for eliminating her bail, Locklear agreed to a judge ordered treatment program for drugs. Within days, she left the program and was reportedly seen back on the street, provoking a police and media frenzy as they searched for the quote, escapee and runaway. CBS 60 Minutes even aired a segment on Locklear. Six days later, Locklear turned herself back into her public defender and she was held on $25,000 bond. Prosecutors charged her with narcotics possession and disorderly conduct and reportedly sought harsher punishment for her because she, quote, put an awful lot of people at risk. In May of that year, Judge Anthony DeMeo determined that Locklear was not a public health risk as she promised no longer to sell sex. He gave her probation and mandated treatment. She reportedly tried to then volunteer with the AIDS project in New Haven, but was rejected. Despite the judge's determination that Locklear was not a public health threat and her own investment in supporting local AIDS work, the fugitive threat that some politicians imagined Locklear to pose served as a rationale to pursue quarantine on a broader scale. Connecticut already had a quarantine law in the books for communicable diseases like tuberculosis, but state representative Richard D. Tolisano a Democrat and civil libertarian, considered proposing quarantine legislation that would apply to people living with AIDS. Tolisano was quoted as asking, if she just has AIDS and isn't bothering anybody, what can you do? On the other hand, if she's knowingly infecting other people, what should you do? Tolisano painted an either or dichotomy of the options available to a sex worker who knows she lives with AIDS. Either she can isolate herself from all risky behavior and therefore quit supporting herself, or she can knowingly infect others. His comments reflected the limitations and understanding possessed by politicians and public health officials, not just about AIDS, but about the material realities and safer sex practices of sex workers. In San Francisco, at the same time, police sent a prostitute suspected of having AIDS to a clinic for screening. But staff at the overburdened clinic asked her to return at a later date because they did not have time to screen her. The woman summed up the dilemma from her point of view, telling the San Francisco Chronicle, I don't like the idea of maybe giving this to someone else, but I don't have any other way to survive other than to work on the street. As Allison O'Daniel writes in her study on Black women surviving AIDS, as strategies for survival, drug use, and sex work may operate to mitigate some conditions of poverty, even while paradoxically increasing the party's vulnerability to HIV infection. Locklear's drug use compounded her situation as she potentially engaged in risky behavior, not just for work, but for addiction or to cope. Even as her drug use was a concern, what clearly drew law enforcement and public health officials to Locklear, uh, public officials in general, was selling sex, which is why Judge DeMaio framed his granting of her probation on the condition she stopped soliciting. Initially, sending her to a drug treatment program functioned to keep her from endangering people on the streets. Certainly, when she fled, it could be assumed she would use drugs again. It could also be assumed she'd try to work. Media and police alike capitalized on, what pos on that possibility as they hurriedly searched for Locklear and reported on her quote-unquote escape. 
It's unclear why after the media and police frenzy, DeMeo gave Locklear only probation. Locklear died in early 1985, just a few months after both houses of the Connecticut state legislature passed a quarantine bill that enabled public health officials to confine certain people living with AIDS. Across the country, fears over female sex workers, especially black women with AIDS, catalyzed questions about quarantine. Whether old quarantine laws and statutes should be applied to individual cases, whether sweeping new legislation should be developed to address the possibility of reckless sex workers, and what the ethics of quarantine measures should be. They also raise questions about the police power of public health officials and the use of criminal arrest and jail to keep people off the streets. Few if any public health officials or politicians quoted in the media paid any mind to the fact that for sex workers, AIDS was not just a health matter, but a labor issue. Few, if any, directed any attention to the women's race, even as race obviously featured centrally in the way public health and elected officials treated these women. In 1988, the American Civil Liberties Union fought the first legal challenge to an AIDS-related quarantine in Doe versus Searcy. In March of that year, the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control quarantined the Black woman known only as Jane Doe because she was allegedly HIV positive and intravenous drug user with unspecified mental health challenges, and she had only social security and prostitution for income. Under South Carolina law, health officials had near absolute power to quarantine this woman, and they did so for as much as 90 days without giving her a hearing, access to legal counsel, or any other due process. Reportedly, an ACT UP chapter traveled to the area to draw attention to the case after local activist Deanna Deanna sought its assistance. Even with ACT UP's presence, this case did not draw media attention. I can't find record of what happened to Jane Doe. By 1991, when police in Alton, Illinois, arrested 21-year-old Felicia Ann Horton for allegedly offering to perform oral sex on an undercover police officer for money, even though she knew she was HIV positive, Doe versus Searcy was the only case at least one observer could find. The local prosecutor filed both a, a civil quarantine action and a felony charge for attempted criminal transmission of the AIDS virus, a charge that did not require proof of transmission. Horton was one of the first people charged in the state of Illinois with a felony related to HIV transmission. Horton had a hard life, as the numerous media interviews with her friends, family, and neighbors made clear. Childhood friend Anissa Womack commented that Horton was a very shy child and subject to teasing. She just never stood up for herself, so they picked on her. Horton's mother reported that she ran away at 12 and lived in foster care or on the streets ever since. She was just wild, her mom said. In describing how her community seemed to regard her, reporter Terry Hughes' column noted, quote, all of it is a bit detached as if the subject were a wild animal that showed up around the neighborhood all the time. The two uses of the word wild here are telling one out of control, and one disconnected from civilization. I'm reminded of a third use of wild and Sadia Hartman's explanation of her methodological approach in her book, Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments. Quote, the wild idea that animates this book is that young black women were radical thinkers who tirelessly imagined other ways to live and never failed to consider how the world might be other way, otherwise. Perhaps this captures Horton's character. After her arrest, Horton agreed to enter a treatment center at an undisclosed location in Northern Illinois. On May 22nd, she walked away only to reappear in a Chicago ER to give premature birth after five months of evading authorities. She reportedly left the treatment center, quote, because she didn't like it and wasn't comfortable there. While she was in hiding, she stayed with another woman in Chicago and had become such good friends with the woman that she named her baby after her. Horton said she'd been receiving welfare payments under her real name through the Illinois Department of Public Aid. Put differently, she seemed to make a life in plain sight outside of the law's lens. Although in the end, authorities did not pursue her for quarantine or the felony charges, so much damage was done. Her identity had been released, prompting concerns that her treatment by media and the legal system were racially motivated. Horton told a reporter that the disclosure had ruined her life. Everybody knew about me, she said at the time. I had to walk around the street with people talking about me. They humiliated me. They destroyed my life. After more run-ins with the law over the course of the next 20 years, Horton tried to fashion another way for herself 
writing in her last journal entry in May 2011. I wish to get myself together to better my life. I'm getting older now, and I should give myself a chance at life. She died two months later, jumping from a moving vehicle, perhaps her last fugitive act. Black women's lives are frequently subject to surveillance, scrutiny, and confinement, and the lives discussed here show how public health and law bridged on their backs. In these early years of the AIDS pandemic, as queer AIDS activists in groups like ACT UP insisted that silence equals death, as Celeste Watkins Hayes notes, women of color living with HIV grappled with the reality that making noise can be just as deadly. The particular kind of attention paid to black women's sex workers' words and actions, including Locklear, Doe, and Horton, illustrate this point profoundly. At the same time that black women's sex workers received fevered responses in places as disparate as Connecticut, South Carolina, and Illinois, the slippage between male sex workers and promiscuous gay men in public prompted rash quarantine proposals in political speeches, state legislatures, municipal health offices, and public health departments, especially in the U.S. South. Paul Cameron, a white man and discredited social, social psychologist from Lincoln, Nebraska, who ran the Institute for the Scientific Study of Sexuality, was the most notorious advocate for such proposals and had surprisingly wide political influence. Cameron weighed in on a, against a referendum in Houston, Texas, for an employment non-discrimination ordinance that protected homosexuals. In his testimony before the Houston City Council against the ordinance, he advocated for, for quarantine for urban gays, most who he claimed, quote, now carry the AIDS germ. His stated intention was to alert Houston citizens of the threat homosexuals pose to the public because of AIDS, in addition to their overall risky lifestyle. Stopping AIDS, in his view, involved, quote, quarantining gays, closing all gay bars and baths, criminalizing homosexual acts that involve exchange of bodily products, and closing the borders to homosexual travel. Cameron, a notoriously anti-gay social scientist considered by some as the grandfather of homophobic junk science, took the quarantine logic to the absolute extreme. His presence in Houston drew a lot of media attention, and reportedly, council members took him seriously enough to ask him questions about the implementation of his proposal. The Houston City Health Director, James Houghton, a Panamanian immigrant who faced significant discrimination as a Black man and a new doctor in the 1950s, even said that though the proposal would end in an illogical conclusion, it was a novel idea. Cameron cannot be credited, but the referendum for gay job rights was defeated by nearly a four to one margin. That Houston got a taste of Cameron's quarantine proposal was fortuitous, as several months later in October 1985, the white male Texas State Health Commissioner, Robert Bernstein, put forth his own quarantine proposal that would have given state or local health officials the power to confine any person with AIDS who was deemed a public health threat because they would not stop engaging in risky activities. Bernstein advocated this proposal after public calls for AIDS to be quarantinable by Houghton, Houston's health director. Houghton, who would later say that breast cancer was a more serious public health threat than AIDS, made this call in light of the infamous and tragic life of an alleged black male sex worker in Houston, Fabian K. Bridges. The details of Bridges' life are contested. The gay press paints a radically different picture than the mainstream media. That the reports conflict is not surprising as it speaks to the reason why marginalized communities have always created their own media to tell stories about themselves from their own perspectives. The conflicting reports and a sensational documentary helped to articulate how a quote unquote incorrigible black gay man alleged to be a sex worker ends up at the center of the AIDS quarantine debate. According to the gay press, Bridges' story came to the attention of public health officials as the result of a Minneapolis based news crew from WCCO TV that came to Houston in the summer of 1985 to learn about the gay community's struggles after the defeat of the employment referendum. That story apparently did not prove to be very interesting, but producers learned about Bridges, <laughs> a black gay man with AIDS struggling with poverty and homelessness. Their recordings became a documentary, which was then aired as part of a PBS Frontline episode, AIDS, A National Inquiry in 1986. Before Bridges was diagnosed with AIDS, he worked a stable job paying $19,000 a year at the Harris County Flood Authority. 
After his diagnosis, he got sick and entered a hospital, soon losing his housing and job. At the time the news crew arrived, Bridges was not even in Houston. After making his way to Indianapolis to try to seek help from his sister and brother-in-law, who would not take him in but affectionately called him by his middle name, Calvin, he ran into trouble with law enforcement for allegedly stealing a bicycle. Knowing he has AIDS, instead of filing charges against him, a judge and law enforcement officers purchased him a bus ticket to Cleveland, where his mother lived. The news crew went to locate him there, where they followed him as he tried to connect with his mother, whose husband would not let Bridges stay with her. Bridges struggled to find other housing since no shelters would take him. He eventually ended up in a hotel room paid for by the Red Cross as he waited for his social security disability payments to begin. Houston's Montrose Voice, a gay publication bearing the name of Houston's gayborhood, Montrose, reported that the news regularly, the news crew regularly paid Bridges for lodging and food in order to continue filming. When Bridges told them he continued to have sex, the crew reported him to Cleveland public health officials. Bridges eluded the film crew and returned to Houston, reportedly to pick up a van he owned to take back to Cleveland. Eventually, Bridges needed money, so he contacted the film crew, which then followed him to Houston. While in Houston, he visited a doctor and told the doctor he continued to have sex, reportedly with at least 20 people. That doctor notified Houghton's office. In late September, Houghton placed Bridges under, under police monitoring and ordered him to quit having sex. Apparently, Bridges initially said he refused the order, prompting an outcry over incorrigible AIDS victims and a two-day police hunt for Bridges where police tried to entrap him into having sex. The tactic did not work, so they arrested him for public urination. An actual violation of his order would have been a third-degree felony, publishable by 10 years in prison and a $5,000 fine. Media relished the story. On October 5th, two doctors who had treated Bridges at different hospitals, one of whom had urged that he be given a quarantine warning, issued a statement defending their actions with Bridges and assuring that their actions were not, quote, anti-homosexual, but pro-health. The one who requested the quarantine warning, a white male physician, Robert Ah, stated, quote, I requested that this quarantine warning be served on Mr. Bridges because he was alone, confused and frightened and obviously needed help. He had repeatedly refused the attempts by discharge planners, social workers, and myself to be placed in a boarding house or to contact the KS AIDS Foundation. He preferred to be an independent street person. Now, the full text of the statement's not available, so it's impossible to contextualize the rest of their comments, but this excerpt is significant. Issued just days after a police manhunt for Bridges and the city health director's order to have to him stop having sex, all suggested his call for quarantine emerged from his humanitarian pity and concern. Because Bridges was alone and in need of assistance, Awe called for his isolation. Awe juxtaposed his rational pastoral care with Bridges' irrational desire to be independent and to remain on the street. Throughout his ordeal, Bridges ended up in Time Magazine and repeatedly in Houston local media. In these depictions, as in the Frontline documentary, few even questioned whether Bridges was okay. Instead, insisting he was clearly demented and needed to be confined to a mental health institution. Diego Lopez, a clinical director for Gay Men's Health Crisis, and the only person of color or person living with AIDS on the Frontline Experts panel, was the only one who expressed concern for Bridges, noting that the depiction of him was racist and homophobic, and that Bridges was victimized by all the systems that failed him. As Judy Woodruff, the host of the documentary, noted, the gay community began protecting Bridges from all the mainstream press. On the advice of people from the gay community, including Houston's well-known white gay activist, Ray Hill, and the KS AIDS Foundation, Bridge voluntarily entered a hospital in early October, then lived with friends for a short time before dying in a hospital on November 17, 1985, and being buried in a pauper's grave because his family had no money for a funeral. The public health officials created hysteria over the need to quarantine Bridges just six weeks before he died. This fact is telling. Friends and supporters reported Bridges was six foot two, 126 pounds, and suffering from genital and rectal herpes before he died. As one friend put it, I feel he could not have given it away, let alone sold it. The public affairs director at WCCO from Minneapolis, which followed Bridges for the documentary, 
admitted that his crew did not know whether Bridge lied about his sexual activity in order to get food and shelter from the reporters. They also denied that Bridges was a prostitute. For Bridges' part, he seemed to have little sense that his story would be taken up in the exploitative way that it was. At the end of the documentary, filmmakers showed a clip of Bridges sitting in his Cleveland hotel room, wearing a black t-shirt and speaking in a soft voice. We do not know what he's been asked, but he said, let me go down in history as being I am somebody, somebody that'll be respected somebody who's appreciated and somebody who can be related to. There's a whole lot of people who just go. They're not even on the map, they just go. Bridges' situation conjoined with one in San Antonio when a man with AIDS who may or may not have been a prostitute told his physician he planned to keep having sex. As reported in the New York Times, when Dr. Karan Rolf, the San Antonio health director learned this, he threatened all 17 known AIDS victims in that city with felony charges if they engaged in irresponsible sexual behavior. Although Health Commissioner Bernstein was adamant that his proposal was not an arrest and incarceration thing, that he was prompted by both fears about Bridges and Roth's threat, make his claim spurious. This was the first time in the United States that public health officials put forth a systematic quarantine proposal to manage people living with AIDS. In December 1985, in a 12-5 to vote, the Texas Board of Health approved Bernstein's proposal to add AIDS to the list of communicable diseases that could justify quarantine. This vote sent the proposal into a 30-day public comment period. After this period, Bernstein decided against the initial quarantine proposal thanks to lobbying efforts by the gay community and public health officials' belief that they needed the gay community as an ally if they were to successfully confront AIDS. Presumably, the influential gay community Ber Bernstein imagined as his allies were middle-class, predominantly white organizations, people from different worlds than Fabian Bridges. Likely, it was the type of people who protested the Frontline Special, not in defense of Bridges' dignity, but because they, quote, feared that Fabian would be seen by the general public as a metaphor for most AIDS victims instead of as the aberration that he was. They feared that the visual impact of the documentary would overshadow the Talking Heads panel discussion that followed, thus feeding a national homophobia that could increase calls for the quarantining of AIDS victims and carriers, end quote. Bernstein reported that his organization would be turning its attention toward public education. Nevertheless, he stated of the quarantine, we're not dropping it. We're just going to try to do it in a less tumultuous way. Here, less tumultuous refers to the manner of doing with less commotion, less disorder, and more peace, as opposed to the doing itself. Several states implemented proposals like the one Texas only proposed, including Connecticut, in light of the uproar surrounding Carlotta Locklear. Black male sex workers continued to be a concern for public health officials and police alike, prompting calls for quarantine and criminalization. The convergence between police and public health becomes even starker in the case of James Henry McIntyre, a 28-year-old cross-dressing gay black male prostitute with AIDS, also known as Miss Pocahontas in the local gay community, perhaps a signaling of indigenous heritage or for another reason unstated. In early 1987, the New York Times reported of McIntyre that he, quote, passes his days in an isolated cell while officials of Jackson and Mississippi debate how to resolve the danger they fear he poses. Sometimes I'm lonely. Sometimes I cry. I, I wish I didn't have to be in here. The police don't like me, he told the advocate. Arrested for prostitution over 60 times, McIntyre was tested for HIV while serving a sentence for a misdemeanor the previous March. A soft-spoken person, McIntyre reportedly asked an interviewer, there's no way you can get rid of the virus. It just carries on. I always use condoms, so I couldn't transmit the virus, could I? We get no sense of how anyone may have answered his question. But even in the moment of this encounter, it seems clear that while McIntyre may not have understood the gravity of his diagnosis, he took precautions that, if always taken, would have protected himself and others. Nevertheless, as with Bridges, some police bought him a bus ticket and sent him to California. With a sick mother in Mississippi, McIntyre returned in September. On December 11th, after being picked up with a well-known white businessman in Jackson, police arrested McIntyre on a disorderly conduct charge, which they upgraded to a felony sodomy charge with a $20,000 bond so he'd remain in jail, which he did for two months. 
While incarcerated, news media learned of his situation as local officials were unsure of what to do. Because as the white assistant district attorney, Tommy Mayfield claimed, this guy is obviously not going to quit doing what he does. As in earlier cases, no one addressed the likely poverty McIntyre faced, having just returned to be with his sick mother after police used his illness as a reason to expel him to another state. Officials never mentioned that selling sex was his means of income. Mayfield looked to state health law for guidance. Under Mississippi law, public health officials had very strong quarantine powers, and state epidemiologist Ed Thompson stated that in the case of McIntyre, if prosecution did not work, he would use his quarantine powers to isolate him. In February, a grand jury decided not to indict McIntyre, and so state health officials decided to use their quarantine power, ordering him not to have sex without revealing his status, the first time such an order had been issued against a male prostitute, according to Dr. James Curran of the CDC. The quarantine order was publishable, punishable by six months in jail and a $500 fine. It also required him to refrain from donating blood and to receive counseling on sexually transmitted diseases. When interviewed by the media, McIntyre, like Locklear and Horton, realized what media had done to his reputation and job prospects, even as he allegedly gave officials permission to talk about his case and insisted he was done with sex work. I'm sure I can't get a job here. I'm sure everybody can recognize my face from TV. With no options before him, McIntyre told the reporter, I just plan to stay with my mother for about three months and then I'm going to California. There he planned to live with his grandmother. He continued with a sobering thought. Sometimes I wish I'd just contracted the disease and died. It would have been better all around. Though we have only traces of McIntyre's life, personality and character, he had a clear understanding of his predicament and how widespread the problem of AIDS was on the streets of Jackson. The police did me so dirty. I would have tried to help them, but I'm not going to help them now, he said. No further information about McIntyre exists. His name occasionally shows up as a small anecdote in discussions of HIV criminalization as his case is among the earliest. But after February 1987, it's as if he disappeared and disappearing him was always the point. In each of these instances, when alienizing logic manifests as the need to quarantine black prostitutes, a tension between casting out and capture looms large. On the one hand, these black prostitutes living with AIDS are cast out by public health officials, police, and the courts, to other cities, to jails, to treatment centers. But when these individuals cast themselves out, they become fugitives in need of capture. These twin logics characterize the construction of a public health and police approach to quarantine on the backs of black people. Yet, as these stories also show, these individuals refused their fungibility and wanted more for themselves. Unsurprisingly, the alienizing logic that animates the relationship between quarantine, criminalization and blackness will become the foundation for the exercise of the most egregious immigration quarantine in US history with Haitians detained in Guantanamo Bay. It's important to note that these cases, the, the, these people's lives are not isolated. Quarantine discourse was powerful in the 1980s. Although every state had some power to quarantine people to prevent the spread of communicable disease, between 1985 and 1987, nine states amended old laws or passed new ones empowering health officials to quarantine people with AIDS, and five states made knowingly transmitting AIDS a crime. What we now call HIV criminalization is the present day manifestation of quarantine logic. As Stephen Thrasher has shown, the results of HIV criminalization has largely impacted black men, especially gay men like Michael Johnson, known in the media as Ty Tiger Mandigo, a former college athlete arrested for sleeping with men without revealing his HIV positive status. As Trevor Hoppe explains, the criminalization of HIV is but one of the more recent examples in public health history of an effort to control disease by coercion and punishment. He calls this phenomenon punitive disease control. My hope is that learning these histories provides us with a framework to understand our present day approaches to diverse people with different diseases that simply couldn't be more urgent. I'll leave it there. All right. Thank you, Karma. That was a very enlightening talk. And unfortunately, a lot of those things sound very familiar today.
Um, my name is Courtney Hobson. I am the program coordinator for the Dresser Center for the Humanities, and I'll be leading uh, today's Q and A. Um, as a reminder, if you do have a question, um, please type it into the Q and A chat box. You can access that by clicking on the um, right hand um, bottom right hand button um, with three dots that says more panels, and then you can pull up Q and A. If you type your questions in there, I will read them as they come in and um, hopefully we can get to all of your questions today. Sometimes people are shy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dean Moffitt. <laughs> No questions are coming in. It's always an awkward way to engage. <laughs> Come on, I know some of you in here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here we go. Uh, this is from Jessica Berman, who's director of the Dresser Center. Um, she wonders if you can extend this analysis to what we are seeing during the pandemic. Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of parallels to be made and a lot of lessons to be learned. And then there's a lot of ways in which, you know, making analogies is dangerous, right? Um, and so I think, um, you know the 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 biggest thing we we see in my view um it's not so much that you know aids was called grid gay related immune deficiency and you know trump calls covid-19 the china virus or chinese virus right those are the obvious ones um but i think it is to say um the same groups of people get targeted for quote unquote bad behavior um meaning uh what Black folks and Indigenous folks and other communities of color are doing uh, draws attention. Um, meanwhile, um, you know, the majority group uh, doesn't get that same attention. And and we've seen this with the police response to COVID. Um, I have a paper that just came out that um, briefly touches on this in the research that Andy, Andrea Ritchie and colleagues have done um, to show the disproportionate police response against Black folks, Black men in particular. Um, with regard to supposedly bad behavior um, that is risky for spreading the disease. Um, so there's that fact. And then of course, who is suffering most, uh, those communities are the same. So, um, and, I, and I think that the flip side of that is the, the lessons about resistance um, that we see from the AIDS era are important lessons for now too, which is to say um, respectability politics is gonna get us nowhere. Um, agitation uh, has to be the way, um, and of course we've seen that uh, after uh, last summer's rebellions too. So um, lots of parallels um, and more parallels going even further back too. So um, thanks for the question. Okay, um, we have a question from Drew Holiday, who's a professor in the English department. Um, how has this project affected your conception of the role of communication and rhetoric in social justice. Thanks, Drew. Uh, it, I think um, you know I do see this book as a as a, a project of rhetorical criticism, a project, a, a kind of rhetorical rhetorical history project in a way. Um, and I think uh, you know one of the things that that these histories show. Um, are the, the deep seated logics that people are using and in order to, to you know, demonize people, um, which is nothing new, of course. Um, but what we didn't see in, in this talk as much is, is the ways that people retool those um, rhetorical practices in the service of um, their resistance in the service of their liberation. Um, and so I think really to understand social justice movements at all project has to be deeply rhetorical um both to really understand what our opposition is doing 
um, not take it at face value, but understand its historical context and really to critique the rhetoric, um, but then also to be really um, uh, smart about what we're doing, um, not just in response, but what we're doing to create the thing that we want to do otherwise. So um, that might be kind of a throwaway answer, but that's what I'm thinking about. Are there any other um, questions from the audience? I had a question or more so um, a comment that is a segue for you to, to promote the work that you're doing right now in Texas in terms of mutual aid and ways in which um, people can support, uh, whether it be donations or other, or other ways. I know that the, the situation in Texas is very unique to Texas in terms of the, the infrastructure, but infrastructure is a problem that we all suffer from in some capacity. Um, and I just wanted, I wondered if you could speak a bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one big lesson of um, American history, maybe of world history, um, but definitely US American history, right, is uh, that in normal times, we, we don't really see infrastructure if it's working for us. We only start to see infrastructure when it's not working for us. For communities of color or other oppressed communities, we see infrastructure all the time because it's not working for us. Um, and in moments like of extreme crisis, so whether that's the COVID nineteen pandemic or whether that's HIV AIDS or or, or whether it's you know the uh, polar vortex in Texas, which is not equipped at all, um, you see so starkly um, how slow. Uh, the the people who uphold the infrastructure are to respond, um, how slow the bureaucracy is to deal with people's real needs. And I think that is by design in a certain way, because if you're a wealthy person who didn't have power and water all last week uh, in Texas, um, you probably found a way to survive without too much problem. You probably had enough dry goods in your house you probably figure out a way to get access to bottled water and make it work. And I know that because that happened to a lot of my friends. Um, but the folks we were supporting um, over the last several days with you know, mutual aid, they, they, don't, they don't have the money to have those stockpiles, right? Um, and so they uh, were literally on the verge of death in some cases. And so um, I think it's always the people who are gonna step up. My friend Jesus Bias always says, uh, all we have is us. And in these moments, that's true. Um, it's not going to be the infrastructure. It's not going to be the state. It's not going to be people in power. It's going to be us. Um, and that's the lesson of AIDS. And that's the lesson of this pandemic and of this moment in Texas. Um, I think Tanya had a question. Tanya, you can turn your camera and mic on to ask it. Thank you. I didn't want to change your, your plan here. Um, so I was typing it, but like I couldn't send it. So thank you so much, Karma, for for your talk. Um, you describe when when you're describing all the chapters in the book, uh, you talk about like how this process of criminalization of Black people with HIV eventually leads to um, immigration bans, but also like of the criminalization of migrant communities. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Um... I mean, I think this is like my own, you know, growth as a scholar. Like, I didn't, uh, I didn't start this out. I, I knew that there was always going to be a, a a chapter about the Haitian detention in Guantanamo in 1991 to 1993. So, for those who don't know that history, um, after Aristide was overthrown, he's democratically elected in Haiti. He's overthrown in a, a military coup, and um, his many of his supporters who had been politically active they have to flee. Uh, and a lot of them are fleeing toward the United States uh, to claim political uh, refugee status. And so, you know, the Bush administration knows this is going to happen. And so, as usual with Haitians, sends the Coast Guard out to um, intercept them. Um, but as they intercept these folks, they realize, you know, most of them actually do have a credible fear. They're not just economic, just economic migrants, right? Um, and so they don't want to take them to the United States, though, so they take them to Guantanamo because Guantanamo is 
not the United States, but it's not not the United States, right? Um, and so uh, this is shortly after the ban on HIV positive migrants has passed, 1987. So they have these folks there, the ones who have a credible fear, and you know, the, the standard for Haitians is much higher than anybody else. They send them on the United States, but there's all these folks who have HIV. Well, there's not much precedent at this point, but it's pretty clear that the HIV ban is not supposed to apply to refugees. But nonetheless, the US government is always happy to make an exception for Haitians. And so they keep close to 300 Haitians in essentially concentration camp conditions on Guantanamo while they decide what they're gonna do with them. And then when they get too sick, maybe they'll send them to the US, they die. Of course, the Haitians are protesting. Naomi Paik has great write-ups about this in her book, Rightlessness. Um, but of, of course, the, the biggest impact of this is gonna be on black migrants. So I always knew I was gonna write about that in, in the book, but I wasn't, you know, for my own racial consciousness, uh, I think as a, as a woman of color consciousness uh, that didn't center blackness the way it should, I wasn't thinking about this as a book about blackness, but then when I started to dig into thinking about quarantine, it was like the whole thing was always about blackness and it doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to other groups, right? So the immigration ban um, is, not it's really about immigrants and xenophobia writ large it's about gay immigrants and of course it's about africans too um perhaps primarily jennifer Breyer would argue um but it's not just about that but it was always completely about that so the book really um became much more about that kind of story um and i don't tell the story about criminalization i kind of uh you know trevor hoppy and others tell and stephen thrasher tell that story, but I, I'm trying to really focus on this public health piece, how it ties into immigration specifically, but it still ends up impacting these communities, black communities more than anybody else. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question. I kind of went on a little journey there. You can follow up if you like. Okay, we have a question from uh, Fred Pincus. Um, the question is the main outlaws uh, meaning anti-maskers of the COVID crisis seem to be white conservatives. Isn't it different than the AIDS crisis? That's a good question, Fred. I mean, I think it, it, it depends on how you're defining an outlaw. So um, if you look at as far, and I, I haven't looked at this, I haven't done a, a, a full assessment, but from what I've looked at, <clears throat> you haven't seen a lot of, um, the anti-maskers who are predominantly white, you haven't seen a lot of them arrested, beat up by the cops uh, for not having masks on. In fact, in in, in uh, New York City, um, white folks have been, you know, gently handed masks by uh, cops. But what you have seen is um, black men in masks. I mean, and, and let's just pause for a moment about the fact that black folks have to walk around wearing masks. And if you're already a, a group that people are afraid of. Now, you're, if you're a large black man walking into Target with a mask on, we know what happens to black men walking to Target, right? Um, and so, but that is borne out that in fact, um, black folks have been much more targeted by policing, by arrest, by harassment, by cops than uh, anti-maskers. And so I think we have to look at the disconnect between a discourse, which especially on the left is very pissed off about anti-maskers, and materially who's being targeted um, even for not doing anything wrong. And I think that that bears out in some ways the same. Okay. Another question from Jessica Berman. How welcoming to buy POC were the ACT UP mutual AIDS groups in the AIDS crisis? Well, this is a, 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 an important question because, and it's, it's a conflicted history, right? Um, you know, the sort of common accepted given knowledge about ACT UP was that it was very racist. Uh, and I think that's true in a lot of ways. Um, if you talk to former ACT UP members, you know, uh, they'll say things like, well, it was really when uh, the immigration working group in ACT UP New York, for example, or uh, the women's working group in ACT UP New York, when they really started to take off, that that's when you saw the white boys kind of break off and sort of 
the science heads going to do treatment and that because that's really all they wanted to focus on they were kind of moving away from a systemic analysis that would have addressed say universal health care um actually including women and in hiv drug trials for example um so i think a hundred percent um act up has a well-earned reputation um act ups around the country of not being welcoming to uh bipoc there's this great uh, quotation in uh brett stockdale's book on AIDS activism where there's a black man, black gay man in LA who was part of ACT UP and um, you know the white guys kept saying to him why, why can't you bring more black people to to ACT UP and, and he says to Stockdale you know many times I couldn't tell if I was at a meeting of the Republican Party if I was a meeting of ACT UP um, because the racism was the same in both. So I think that that is absolutely the case but I also think um, there is an, another history, part of which my book tells about um, ACT UP organizations really working closely with like immigrant rights organizations. So ACT UP San Francisco and Golden Gate uh, work closely with the California uh, Immigrant Refugee Rights and Services uh, group with uh, religious organizations working on immigration issues um, to focus on how AIDS was impacting um, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. And you see some of that with ACT UP around the Haitian detention too, trying to reach out to um, Haitian groups, trying to uh, reach out to Black AIDS mobilization, for example. Um, but, you know, uh, does that mean they weren't racist? No. Okay, are there any more questions? If not, I would like to thank Karma for joining us this afternoon. Um, the book, The Borders of, of the AIDS Crisis. Um, what is the, I keep forgetting the title of the book. Today. It's all right, it's The Borders of AIDS. It's good. Yes, The Borders of AIDS, it comes out in this spring. Um, April specifically, is that when it comes out? It'll probably be May or June. May or June, okay. And if you want to connect with Karma, um, you can find them on Twitter at Queer Migrations. Um, thank you for joining us. And I hope everyone has a good rest of their evening and, and stay warm and stay safe in Texas. Thank you so much, y'all. I appreciate it. Take care.